Karma is an oriental word, which has found its way into most English dictionaries. It stands for a principle of Eastern philosophy which is variously interpreted. To the average Western thinker, particularly the theologian, the term is objectionable, although the equivalent is found in the New Testament. As we are told in the New Testament, as a man sow it, so shall he reap. This is very largely the traditional explanation or interpretation of the word karma. It also is found in the Buddhist scriptures, where Buddha says, effects follow their causes as the wheels of the cart follow the foot of the oxen. Therefore, we are dealing with cause and effect. We are not dealing with punishment per se. We are not referring to a condition after death or in life in which evil forces take over the life or consciousness of a human being. We are not relating to demonology, nor to a Hades populated by ghosts and monsters. The word is simply a term to signify that the effects are inherent in their causes. Scientifically, this would probably not be seriously disputed. We observe every day that causes produce consequences, but most people are so much interested in their own ideas about consequences that they overlook the problem of causation. Today, as we look around us, we see an almost classical example of how causes produce their effects, how the way we do things becomes the way in which we are rewarded or punished. Karma is not a punishment bestowed by heaven. It is not a painful work given by deity to wayward children. Karma is simply the fact that there are rules in the game of life, rules in creation, rules that are just as inflexible as the law of gravity, rules that cannot be violated, and long ages of contemplation has built these rules into the theological writings of most of the nations of the world. These rules have first observed our remote ancestors saw them. They did not know what they meant, and they did not know why they happened, but they learned, through thousands of years of experience, that things that they did had consequences, and that these consequences were more or less inevitable. They found in those days that the individual who broke the common rules of life suffered. He suffered not because a divine power looked down on him and punished him. He suffered simply because he broke the law of cause and effect. This law is impersonal, it is just, it cannot be arbitrated, and it cannot be not nullified or changed by almost any process that we can think of. Actually therefore, we live in a world in which we have to be thoughtful of what we do if we wish to enjoy the maximum benefits of existence. The purpose of knowledge, finally, is to discover what we can do that does not result in trouble. Ignorance, consequently, is the condition of being unaware that what we do has consequences. Now, we are mostly willing to accept certain visible forms of consequences. We know that if we eat the wrong foods, we will have dyspepsia. We know that if we become bound to drugs or narcotics or alcohol, we will pay for this indiscretion. We know that we are capable of improving our living, or destroying ourselves according to our understanding and application of the principles of cause and effect. So the philosophy has, as its primary purpose, an effort to demonstrate clearly, for the benefit of all concerned, that you cannot make a mistake without getting into some kind of trouble. Now, we can say that people do not know when they make a mistake. In certain cases this is true, but in the majority of instances the mistake is intentional. It is intentional because the individual is more interested in getting something that he wants, or avoiding something he should face, than he is in thinking about the law of cause and effect. He thinks that evasion is possible, which it is not. He thinks that he can overlook rules in nature, and that nature will overlook these mistakes. It will not happen this way, because practically every mistake that can be made has consequences which are unfavorable. Now, of course, we can't all be perfect in everything. We'll all be subject to the mistakes for a long time to come. But one of the commonest things that we might be able to do would be to build a pattern of the more common, simple and obvious mistakes, and how to avoid them. We should be teaching children certain rules to avoid mistakes, on the consequential theory that these rules must be followed or trouble will follow. So karma becomes in our personal living as a force to take the place of the purgatories of ancient theologies. Instead of the individual going to some mysterious place after death where he will be boiled in oil, he can escape this very morbid and melancholy fact by realizing that the effects of causes are worked out on the same plane where the causation occurs. If we make a mistake on the physical level, we will pay for it physically. If we do something noble and glorious on the, the physical level, we will be rewarded accordingly. Karma as much deals with rewards as it does with punishments. If our mistakes are never overlooked, our virtues are not forgotten either. Everything we do right has certain enduring consequences for our betterment, improvement and security. Therefore, karma actually is impersonal. It has nothing really to do with what we want or what we do not want. Karma has to do with what we have done, 
why, and how. It has to do with the simple payment of debt. It is like the individual who borrows more money than he can pay, and in the end lands into bankruptcy. This is not because God determined to break him. It is not because these laws are written in the scriptures. It is really because the individual has done something he should not do. And he either did it from ignorance or from intent. Now, in the philosophies of life, ignorance is no excuse beyond a certain point. The individual who makes mistakes he doesn't know about, and has no way of estimating, can get into some trouble, but there are forms of forgiveness, above or barred in Gilead, which will help him. The individual generally does not have unintentional mistakes, because the things he does while he makes mistakes are things he knows about. Therefore he knows that he shouldn't have done them, and often regrets even before the results set in. This leaves many people in the arms of a quandary. If everything we do has consequence, suppose we do nothing. Suppose we wrap up in isolation and sit like St. Simon's stylites, on the top of a column in the Libyan desert. We don't speak to anyone. We don't do anything. We live as nearly helplessly as possible. Ask no one for anything, and tell no one anything. Would this settle karma? Yes, it would. But what is the karma of taking that attitude? The individual who sits alone long enough is paying karma right at that moment. He has given up making one kind of a mistake, has made another, and is sitting alone in the desert trying to understand the new mistake that he has just made. To do nothing therefore is not a solution. The only proper solution is to try through study thought and experience, to do those things which are useful. From the moment of birth on, the individual is subjected to factors and factions with which he must contend. He must adjust to a world which perhaps he does not fully appreciate or does not wish to tolerate. But actually he is here for a purpose. We are all here for one purpose primarily, and that is to grow, no matter what we think of it. This world is a schoolhouse, and in this schoolhouse we are here to learn lessons. The two factors that are important in our education are, is the education itself correct? And, have we the courage to follow it if it is? Young people should understand that the law of cause of effect, our karma, is not theological. It really has nothing to do with the religious beliefs of people. It has appeared in almost every religion because it is a dominant factor in ethics, but the law of cause of effect is not part of theology. The only proper solution is to try through study thought and experience, to do those things which are useful. From the moment of birth on, the individual is subjected to factors and factions with which he must contend. He must adjust to a world which perhaps he does not fully appreciate or does not wish to tolerate. But actually he is here for a purpose. We are all here for one purpose primarily, and that is to grow, no matter what we think of it. It is just as much part of science or philosophy, or ethics, or art or literature. It is part of the complete pattern of life. It rules the businessman and it rules the poet. It governs the doctor and the bishop. These rules are all applicable to every walk of life, but they are definitely based upon a simple concept. You cannot do anything without causing a consequence of some kind. The knack of it we might say is to keep on doing those things the consequences of which are enjoyable. Karma therefore is not merely an instrument of punishment. Karma gives us just as many rewards as it seems to give us penalties. But both the rewards and penalties are due to ourselves. We are the maker of karma and destiny in our own personal lives. There is no way of blaming this upon some vast, universal mystery. Of course, cause and effect is recognized in most sciences. It is recognized in law and medicine. It is recognized in ethics and most of the philosophical systems of the world. But it is there because it is just as much a part of us as breathing or blood pressure, or any of the anatomical, physiological or biophysical functions of the human being. Having settled in our own minds one simple point, that what we do is the basis of what we are, and what we are doing now is the basis of what we will be in times to come, we then come upon another attitude that has arisen, which is more theologized, and that is what we are doing now may have a relationship to the past. Are we paying old debts now? This is a serious matter, because there has been some discontent and disparagement of this concept. However, the individual comes into this life with his past inside of him. It is part of his consciousness. It is part of his experience. Therefore in most instances the individual sets his past to work again in this life. When he grows up selfish he might have brought the selfishness with him, because it was part of the fact that he had not outgrown it, but that selfishness expressing in this life will cause the troubles which start the reactions of cause and effect. Therefore it is the weakness in ourselves that perpetuates the unfinished business of human evolution. Until this is fully understood we cannot control the situation, 
but if we do not wish to be burdened by past karma we must make sure that we have paid the bill for when the mistake was made. If we haven't then we have unfinished business, and that unfinished business is to learn and understand why our old attitudes must inevitably react upon us somewhere, sometime. There is no way of escaping them, but there is a way in the sense of transmuting them, so there is an alchemy also in karma. There is something about it that is very much like a remedial course in healing. The physical person through wrong diet, through wrong exercise, should dissipation to get sick and the body becomes the instrument for the karma, but he is suffering for the mistakes of that which lives in the body. If this can go on indefinitely the individual can say this is fate, it is inevitable that I shall have heart attacks or the kidneys will give out, and the individual can just go along until he dies of his complaints. Or he may decide that life is still worth living, and that he'd better do something about his mistakes. If therefore he sets to work to correct the mistakes that are destroying him, the mistakes he has corrected cannot destroy him, because they have ceased to exist. Most karma ceases to function when the reason for it is exhausted. If the person has learned the lesson he does not face it twice. If he has done what he should have done, anywhere along the line and had faced it, the issue would be dead, but as a matter of fact very few people, as you will know if you would look around, really face into their own mistakes. The first thing they try to do is to blame the mistake on something else. At the moment our greatest scapegoat for mistakes is either politics or economics. We blame these for all of our troubles. Well, the only reason why we have these troubles is because they are part of our acceptances in life. The individual does not want to make bad karma, but he wants to make the last dime he can on any job that he has. He does not really prevent the ulterior motives which begin to produce karma. An ulterior motive is a magnificent cause for karma, and it will move in with all intensity. Not because it doesn't like us, not because God is mad at us, not because the devil he wants to claim us as his own, but simply because we have failed to correct a common mistake which our own conscience and character should have told us about. Therefore, conscience is something inside the individual that is forever warning against mistakes. Warning against compromises of one kind or another. Conscience of course functions best in a convivial attitude. The individual's conscience works best in a society in which consciousness is strong. Whereas now where consciousness is not very strong conscience does not work very well. The individual has to stand against the mistakes by a personal action of his own will. When we get all mixed up in this kind of an involved economic structures we have today, it seems almost inevitable that individuals will develop wrong attitudes toward life. They will become desperate. They will become frightened. They will develop hates. There will be terrorism, massacres, civil war, mutiny and everything you can think of, but these things are not due to the punishments of heaven. They are due to the unfinished business of our own. They are due to the fact that we have not set up in ourselves the cures for the ailments that are closing in on us. We are not making the basic changes that would result in a new level of effects. We are keeping on the old causes, hoping to force or bluster or fight our way through. We are here doing exactly what has made the mistakes of the past, and we are doing it with the desperate determination to get by in a happy way while doing the things that must make us unhappy. This type of thing comes into karma. The other side of the coin is also worth remembering. There is not anything that happens in life that is good that is lost. The idea that deity has a book and writes all these good deeds in the book, and adds it up for our advantage is not quite correct. It's a good symbolism, but that's all. The book is in ourselves. The things we have done right become the basis of the growth and development, and liberation of the human soul. The individual who has done what is right may have limitations, may have some suffering, because it is not possible to do what is right in a society that does not recognize right, but the individual is a passing motion in this society. He is born, he suffers and he dies, but his character is his own and goes with him to eternity. Thereof he may have to sacrifice some advantages here in order to ensure that he will be in better condition in the course of the future. This is why we look forward to a new age. If a new age is one in which the entities of a previous generation was supposed to have learned something, begin to come back into incarnation, and coming back bring with them the new growth they have made, the new understanding they have achieved, and the new longings for a better way of life, and each individual returning with a little more integrity brings about a civilization with greater integrity. It all adds up to progress. In daily contact we have another peculiar habit, and I notice this a great deal from people who come to me for one reason or another. Mistakes which cause suffering. The suffering is keenly remembered, but things that go well are not noted. The individual seems to take it for granted that his reward should also be good and therefore nothing unusual. However the rewards that are not good are painful, 
and these are very unusual, so the person has a tendency to overlook his blessings in favor of his misfortunes. I have talked to many people who have outlined at great length all the miseries they have gone through, but after some conditioning we discover they had some pretty good things happen to them which they did not even remember. Once the mind settles on misery it is hard to move it. It wants to continue negative thinking. This caters to another problem in human nature, and that is self-pity, and if there is a creation that is sorry for itself it is humanity. It's been sorry for itself from the first day. Therefore the desire to be sorry for oneself sort of has a dignity about it. It has a maturity about it. The sufferer feels superior. He has had a greater and more dismal existence. He is subject to martyrdoms that have made him very important in his own sight, but he has not learned the most important lesson of all, and that is that he must understand cause and effect. He must realize that the causes of the things that make him miserable are in himself, not in society, and the causes of the nice things that he will not admit, these causes are also in himself and pass unnoticed. So it is very important for people to realize that karma, our consequences, is not merely punishment. It is the individual achieving that which he deserves, and that the more constructive his deserving may become, the greater his good cause and effect will function. He must realize the causes of the things that make it, so we think very definitely of the importance of building positive patterns of conduct. That we are not here to estimate the punishments that we are going to receive. We are here rather to so live that these punishments fade out. On the basis of the problems that we are confronted with in society today, we can look at the world as it is. We can look at the different attitudes that rule conduct. I think that most people will realize that the world at this time is not governed by the best possible attitudes. It is governed by selfishness, it is governed by ambitions that are false or excessive. It is developing around a financial center that is unendurable, and it is also exploiting and destroying the natural resources. All these things are happening. Every newspaper has articles on them. Every individual knows something about these matters, but he continues to ignore them, either believing there is nothing he can do about them, or that he is too busy doing other things that he prefers to do. The great working of karma sometimes brings a human being to the edge of chaos. It brings collective humanity, of which we are a part also, to the brink of chaos. As Saint Augustine pointed out long ago, in the days of the anti-Nicene fathers, the human being has certain privileges of energy. There are things he can do and things he cannot do. One of the things he can do is improve himself. One of the things he cannot do successfully is to dominate other people. The moment he begins to dominate other people he creates a reaction. On a level of religion, whenever religions go out to proselyte and determine by force or otherwise to conquer masses of human beings, these religions themselves are in grave trouble and ultimately come to an inglorious end. Everything that is wrong ultimately fails. There is no way of escaping this inevitable fact. In ourselves, within our own natures, we have a certain type of consciousness, insight, understanding, or whatever you want to call it, by means of which we intuitively recognize values that we do not wish to consciously acknowledge. We call this conscience, but it is more than that, it is the subconscious set within ourselves by which we participate in the universal plan of things. Way down deep in ourselves we know the rules, but by the time we have filtered this knowledge, through emotion, thought, and action, it has lost the name of significance in many cases. But down inside of each individual the law of cause and effect is in existence at all times. It is part of this overself of Amazon. It is part of this divine part of man which, while in place enclosed in body and encased in material concerns, is still alive and well. We have to realize that when the voice inside of ourselves warns us, we should give very definite consideration to that warning. They say the law of cause and effect can't be proved as far as the moral issues are concerned, but this is not strictly true either. The moral issues are provable, and the ethical life of the individual can be made scientific. Lord Bacon points out in The Advancement of Learning, that if we want to know more about religion we study science. If we want to know about science we study philosophy, and if we want to know about religion, philosophy and science we study art. These are all interrelated factors. All of them subject to the laws of cause and effect, and everywhere we turn the rules are the things we have to search for, for if we do not have the rules, and the courage to abide them, our lives will be a series of conflicts and contradictions, with karma manifesting principally as discomfort. There is no reason why this has to be true however if we are able to handle the situations that we create. There is another point that the oriental philosophers have made, a little more clearly perhaps than we have here, 
and that is the individual is not responsible personally for that which is beyond his comprehension. That which he does not know and cannot find out he is not responsible for. He is only responsible for the gamut of his attained ethics. He has to live within the range of what he knows is right, and what he knows is wrong, and the karma that we suffer from results from that which we know and do not assume and accept. We cannot be held responsible for conditions that are completely beyond our consciousness or beyond our control. We are responsible for everything that is within the familiar pattern of the genome. Now what are the patterns of the genome for the most part for the individuals themselves? It is his daily life, it is his conduct, it is his growing up. The rules also involve his education, his schooling, his trade, his art, his profession, of whatever he selects as a livelihood. Going a little further it comes into his emotional life. He becomes a person with responsibility for family. Both men and women therefore share this responsibility equally. They know what it means, and if they do not know it is because they have deliberately ignored it, because anyone who wishes to know the facts about common occurrences can find them if he wants to. He comes into the family life, and together the husband and wife accept the responsibilities of cause and effect as these apply to the family. The neglect of these laws in family relationships can be very serious. For instance, in the family if one of the parents at least becomes completely selfish, indifferent of the rest of the family, and goes out in search of fame or fortune, then that is creating bad karma for that person. A karma which they must ultimately face. The result of this karma is of detriment to society. Under those conditions karma appears as punishment, but it is also to be remembered that this detriment to the others may draw out of them a greater good that they would otherwise have ever known. They may rise above this loss, this failure of one member, and become very strong, and brilliant, and wonderful people. Therefore that which is a punishment for one may be in turn an ultimate benefit for someone else, but the fact is that the other's benefit in no way reduces the karma of the person who neglects. These things fit together in very intricate patterns. Then they go out into life, there are all the things that the person wants to be, and to do, and to have. He builds a career. Now the women are going out and building careers also, and the world of careers is becoming tremendously important. Career generally means that that the person becomes a better person, better equipped to face life, and better able to achieve the integrities of independence, but for the most part that is not the way it is used. This advancement is not controlled by any ethical or moral motivation. The individual wants greater liberty to do exactly what he wants to do, and if what he wants to do is against the rules of karma he is in trouble, and most of the time it is. The individual who is a wastrel, the individual who is extravagant and dissipated, the individual who allows his morality to collapse because of wealth. This is all karma causing, and the karma is going to be far more difficult to overcome than the financial ascension to which the person has made an adjustment. We have all the way along, interlocking. One man's karma reward is another man's punishment. It all works from the integrity center within the person themselves however, and this integrity center must not be violated. Knowledge as we know it today claims all kinds of purposes and motivations, but the essential reason for knowledge, the real basis of our desire to know, is that we must learn to know what is right and wrong for ourselves. We must discover the truth, the life, the pattern which is possible for us to fulfill without danger or pain or suffering. We may have certain limitations, but the limitations in turn may also be liberations, depending on how we look at them. At the end of a certain length of time the human being begins to drift into what we might term retirement. He is getting to the end of most of the adventures of living. He has gone as far as he can industrially, economically and so forth and so forth, and he is now coming to the time when he must review and regulate his own life. One of the unfortunate aspects of karma, if we wish to call it such, is neurosis. Neurosis is not an individual who is really in great trouble. A neurosis is an individual who has misinterpreted, misunderstood, and misused the advantages of living. He has accepted everything as punishment that was in any way an interference with his personal pleasure. The law tells us for one thing that pleasure is good, we should all have it, but it is not the primary purpose for existence. We are not created primarily simply to have fun. On the other hand, good karma coming can be very amusing very entertaining and very refreshing, but it has to be earned. The older person settling down begins to wonder what he was here for in the first place. He does not understand, he does not know, he does not realize, he lives in a world which to him is a mystery. He has learned very little about life except that he is gradually departing from most of the attitudes that he held firmly in earlier years. This all adds up to the fact that if the human being was here forever, 
and if the gift of immortality was generally available we might have a different attitude toward life, but life is really a day at school. It is part of a long program of education, and the most important thing for each individual in this school is to graduate with honors. Now when you leave school you can graduate with honors only if you are a good student. You can also graduate without honors if you are a good athlete and support the finances of the institution. On this basis we have quite a number of athletes. Not necessarily who play games or sports, but who are graduating from school on the basis of something that they have done for the school, rather than something they have learned from it. This problem is that when you graduate you need to graduate without a passing mark or a high mark, but this does not mean that your education is complete. It is complete only when it advances you to the purpose for which you have devoted your educational career. Most of all it is an education that enables you to estimate yourself. Estimate what your abilities are, what your dynamic interests are, and not lead you in the general degree that you graduate without any purpose for education. Education can be a luxury, it can be a fad, or fancy, but it is only useful if the individual uses it to understand the operation of cause and effect in his own life. Therefore he should have a course on karma in every grade and he should learn how to graduate from that course cum laude, instead of at the bottom of the class. The problem of karma then means that we are here to find out more about what we can do and what we can't do. It is too late to find out what we can't do on our deathbeds. This is not what was intended. We should be learning something every single day, and we should poke into our own subconscious and find out what we can learn immediately that makes today better for us, or will affect us constructively in the comparatively near future. We must therefore begin to study on a life principle that we are expecting things to have a harvest like themselves. That whatever we do will be done to us. Whatever we learn we will be able to use. What we do not learn, or mislearn, will be of detriment to us. In the past, when life was largely suburban and persons came from small communities, the opportunities for grand knowledge were few. Today in the various media available we can see the whole pattern of world mistakes played out before our eyes. We can see different falls and failings all over the world, and the consequences. We can understand terrorism, we can realize a narcotics addition, we can recognize the causes of all these things because they are played out in front of us. We have never had so much available evidence in various ways. Now it is possibly quite true that some of this evidence is wrong. There are definite mistakes in the spreading of news and the estimation of events. However, for the most part the facts themselves stand. These facts, while they may be misinterpreted, are enough in themselves to remind us of the facts about ourselves, and to remind us that in studying our own facts we also misinterpret them as generously as possible. We are not willing to accept them any more than nations and civilizations are willing to accept their mistakes. In the last two or three thousand years we have fought more wars than we should ever fight. We have also fought many of their in search for truth, in search for religion in an effort to improve or reform mankind, but we have left the earth with the bodies of the dead scattered about promiscuously. We should be able to just look back or a few years to see what we ought to be learning. This mysterious inevitable consequence of action that we should see how one by one the dictators fall. One by one the criminals fall. One by one the selfish fall. All these things are obvious to the thoughtful person, but the individual who has his own pressures seldom understands or accepts this evidence. He is going to be different. Other people may have to pay their debts, but he is going to find some way of getting out of his. This is very common in finance, and has lead to constant ruin and impoverishment. The only answer to the whole problem is ethical integrity. There is no way of getting away from karma unless the individual is mentally, emotionally morally and physically honest. Honesty is the secret of survival, and it minimizes nearly all the problems of life. The individual who is emotionally and mentally honest has a great deal more chance of being physically healthy, because the disturbances of the emotions are what cause a great deal of sickness. Almost all of the troubles that we have arise from the interference that we create between the levels of our own constitution. The mind betrays the heart, the heart betrays the health, and all these things fall into a common ruin, but we have to realize that there are laws of karma that apply to every aspect of existence. There are laws of karma that are peculiarly created for the benefit of bumblebees. There are laws of karma that are necessary for the motion of stars. There are laws of cause and effect controlling everything that exists in the universe and existence itself. Therefore all things are surviving because they live in an intricate pattern where survival is necessary, and where the breaking up of survival is destructive to the entire pattern of life. Bring this down to our little daily living and the problems that we all have to work with, 
the problem is solved by carefully estimating the relationship between our actions and integrity, or the relationship between our pressures and common sense. Is the individual for example who has found increased or improved financial condition, making good use of this additional gain? Is he being faithful on the small things, so then he could be made faithful onto larger things? Now maybe he was grateful for the small things because he couldn't help himself. But when he got greater things he began to be so happy about it all that he broke every rule in the book. This all becomes part of the problem. The more we have, the more responsible we become for what we do with it, and the proper use of it is a factor in karma, a very definite factor. Ben Franklin summed up the simple words, waste not and want not, and that's cause and effect, just a simple statement of it. Every individual must use what he needs and has well, or else suffer from the karma of having abused them. All kinds of elevations of a state are blind and meaningless, unless the elevation causes the individual to become a better servant of humanity. Wherever promotion results in increased finance and privilege and no responsibility, bad karma is not far away. All the way along, everything we do has to be estimated in terms of consequence. If we have children, we have to take the time to educate them. If we have a proper job, we must do it well. We cannot shoddy our work without ultimately causing karma, and if enough people shoddy their work, it is almost impossible for any of us to get a piece of work done honorably. This is not because the devil has been whispering in ears all the way along. It is simply because we are all setting the example to each other, and for the most part the example at the moment is not good. We have to begin this way to really try to find out what is possible to us, so that we will not make these karmic decisions that hurt us. We should so live that as we drift through the years of life, that we have as much peace and harmony as possible, and continue to be as useful as possible. The perfect life is the useful life. The idea that success is to avoid or evade responsibility and labor, these are fictitious ideas. Karma will punish the individual who believes that what he has should be kept in his own pocket as long as he lives. All these things represent misuses of things, and karma is the great pageantry of use and misuse. We look around a little bit and we find people who are doing very lovely things, very beautiful things, very wise things. This does not mean that these wiser people don't suffer a little. Everyone suffers in an unfinished universe, but it means that in compensation for a misfortune there is such an internal enlightenment that the misfortune loses nearly all of its tragedy. The individual who does the best he can really and honestly when faced with a responsibility is given unusual resources. Sometimes he prays for divine help, but the prayer is backed by his own integrity, and if those work together the job is likely to become solved and the problem be met. All these things relate so definitely to human conduct and personal integration that it seems that we should give this matter a great deal of careful thought. We should try to find ways in which we can cure this mysterious disease of indifference and lassitude with which most people seem to be suffering. We talk to folks every day and we find more and more people are dissatisfied with the actions of their associates. The individual even though he is not honest himself objects to the dishonesty of others. He is looking for a better world, even though he is contributing nothing to produce it. So here we have somewhere near 5 billion human beings living on a small ball in space. This little assemblage, which looks very big to us, does not look very big from a constellation far off. It is because it's a little molehill on which we live, but here we are with lessons to learn, and these lessons are first grade instruction in the ruling of the cosmos. If somewhere along the line, as some schools of philosophy believe, our elevation will ultimately result in us becoming part of a great evolutionary program that will come into existence in the future. That each one might have an executive place in the great enfoldment of the constellations of stars and elements. If this be true, and it may be we cannot say it won't be true, then this is part of our educational field. Here we are trying to solve a very simple problem. A problem is not beyond our capacity. We want to live quietly and peacefully. We want to have enough to take care of ourselves respectably and with reasonable pleasantness. We want to get along with each other in amity. We want to have our beliefs respected, and in time we will learn to respect the beliefs of others. We want a harmonious pleasant world, and when two people out of this hope both marry they expect to live or hope to live in a happy and harmonious family. They want the things to happen immediately which are the greater good for all concerned. They are perfectly willing if they care to do something to motivate the good and well-being of others. Reforms nearly always start not with pure intellection, but very largely with emotion. We get further by the love of truth than we do trying to understand it. The moment our affections are warm, kindly and friendly, 
and we recognize the natural and inevitable tie between all living things. When this begins to sink into our consciousness we find that love takes the place of law in many things, but love is a fulfillment of law and not an escape from it. If love is real the law will not be broken. If love is unreal the law will be broken. And if the law is broken, the love will fail. This is all part of a very big pattern, but the kindness of heart, unselfishness, integrities, values peace and affection, responsibility, recognition and admiration for achievement. All these things are part of building a world in which the law of cause and effect is going to produce the results we most want. We want to live in a world in which it is right, but we have to cause right or it will not happen. We pray to heaven to solve our problems, but heaven does not solve things that way. Heaven determines that each individual must have the vital experience of solving his own problems. We all feel you know that somewhere there is something that can get us out of our difficulties, and we like to think that perhaps religion will do it. Well religion will do it if that religion inspires us to do it for ourselves. If, on the other hand, this religion promises us freedom from the responsibilities we deserve and will not acknowledge the correction of the proper mistakes, if the religion throws all burdens on the Lord and lets the individual do as he pleases, then we will continue to the future with exactly the problems we have today. To solve problems is a job. It is a profession. It is a dedication. It is an inevitable duty. Now working with people a great deal as we have we find out some problems that are comparatively frequent. One of the most common problems I guess today is this problem of dissatisfaction with world conditions. We don't like things the way they are. We don't like bombings. We do not like to have terrorist groups wandering about the earth. We hope and desire to have a normal and reasonable kind of existence. Why don't we have this? It is because we have not built it into the contracts between nations. We have not said that a treaty is finally a bondage of integrities. When the United Nations meets it should meet with each candidate. Each member should be dedicated to truth, and not coming down with the information given him by some military dictator in the background. We cannot have any of the things we want without integrities, and chaos is the karma of lack of integrity. It is what happens when nobody does it right. A lot of people want to do it right, but the interferences are hard to face, are hard to cope with. So we can say that the best chances for doing it right are among people who have dedicated themselves to a self-improvement, who are seeking in one way or another to grow, to be better, not in order that they may dominate others, but in order that they may enlighten themselves. If we recognize a divine principle at the core of our own existence, if we know that there is a God in us and that this God within us is part of the inheritance from space, we have within ourselves an inevitable power for right. We have within ourselves the capacity to grow, to enlighten ourselves, to perfect our own temperaments and dispositions, and to do those things which are most useful to our world. This is in us. It is the seed of the everlasting, sowed in the earth of the transitory. Is that which is our proper and inevitable mystery of the seed, the mustard seed, which, though the smallest of all seeds, grows into a great tree for the shelter of the birds and for shadow and shade for human beings. Our enlightenment coming from the divine seed within ourselves has to be one way or another developed. It has to be developed, sometimes against a lot of adversities, and we may assume at the present moment that most people reaching maturity have not had necessary instruction in this particular area. Not one of the sacraments that we generally acknowledge in the church, but the sacrament of dedication. That just as surely as we have baptism and we have the sacrament of marriage, confession, absolution, Eucharist all these things, that we also have the sacrament of dedication. Not a sacrament to become a clergyman, but a sacrament to dedicate life to its essential purpose. They have grown up in a system which is largely materialistic, and therefore continuing with all the old problems. It has grown up in a narrow atmosphere, in an atmosphere of self-centeredness, even though it has been comparatively moderate in its ambitions, but it has not been a dedication to purpose. I think that we should recognize the importance that every young person growing up should in some way or another be aware of a sacrament. Somewhere along the line each individual should come face to face with the realization of the natural responsibilities that are his in life. Actually ancient people had this. It is strange that it was one of the things that dropped out, but back in the very early days of civilization and into some of the more recent oriental systems a child was not born a citizen. This is very important thinking. A child was not born as a citizen. It had only a milk name, in other words it had a child name. It grew up in the family, with this child name. In Egypt the child wore a lock of hair, sort of twisted down over the eye. The rest of the head was bald, shaved and clean, but this lock was the child lock. At a certain period, in a certain time in its life, 
the child was taken to the temple. With all the ceremony necessary, all of the relatives, friends, the whole community were in the cheering area, taking care of making this a festive occasion. At this moment the child, now old enough to make a personal decision, usually in the middle or later teens, took the oath of obligation to his world. He was transformed from a child to a person. This was true also of women. It was not limited to men. This was a right of citizenship. A person who dedicated himself to the service of good, who offered his life for the protection of his family, his community and his world, became a citizen. He became a citizen by accepting the responsibilities of adulthood. He became a citizen by becoming an example of right in his community. He was a dedicated and sanctified person, living to fulfill the real reason for a human being's existence. Then his child lock was cut off, and his name was given to him, his grown-up name, a name that indicated his place in the tribe, and when this was given to him he took his oath of obligation to the tribe and when the tribal members met he sat with them. He was part then of the family to which he belongs, not the just family of his own house, but the family of the clan, the tribe, the group of which he was a member, and for that group he was dedicated to live, to serve it and to die to save it if necessary. There was no longer any of this going off by yourself to make it rich, or something of that nature. It was all part of a system, because without this consecration antiquity could never have survived. It survived because everyone stood firm for that which the tribe stood for, and the tribal with wisdom the surrender of the tribe distended from the heroes of the past who had given their lives to make the present possible. They had gone out and sacrificed everything so that their descendants could have a better life, and it was the privilege and right of these improving descendants to honor the virtues that they had inherited and to protect them for the future. This citizenship of the tribe is a very interesting and important thought at least. It changes the whole aspect of things. The young individual is not out to make his own way primarily. He will make his own way, in all probability, because his dedication does not make him useless, it makes him useful. It makes him able to live a better person himself, to do his job better, and at the same time always remember his relationship to the group and his part in their success. So this type of thinking was part of a cure for what we might term cause and effect as we know it today. If we had brought forward the causes of good, if we had brought forward the wisdom of antiquity, we would not now be in this particular condition. The attitude or belief that we should forget the past and live in the glorious present, and make it worse in the future, is not very successful. It is not going to do much for us, but it's going to do a lot to us if we do not gradually recover from the present attitudes. When then comes the idea of what happens when you do it right. When you do it right you gradually see the good of the human being and the good of the neighbor. You see the achievement of the human brotherhood, which has been the great teaching of religions since the dawn of time, becomes possible. We can be one family, not because we all agree with each other, but because all of us agree with the principles under which we live. We believe in the rights of the other person just as much as our own. We do not step on the liberties or values of other people, but we tread carefully upon their weaknesses and try to help to strengthen the life of the person. We are here as a family, and this family has collective karma just as well as it has individual karma. The condition we see today is simply the inevitable outcome of long-abused privileges, long-wasted resources, and a continuing emphasis upon selfishness. Many people feel there is nothing left but to be selfish, and they hope that the end of their lives will release them from this wheel of Ixion upon which they have crucified themselves. This is not necessarily true however, because the law of karma is also correlative with reincarnation or rebirth, and rebirth is simply the opportunity to complete unfinished business. Business is always unfinished until the individual attains enlightenment. Enlightenment is the final victory of the internal over the external aspects of life. It is the victory of God over the misuses which we have associated with religion, science, philosophy and the arts. Reincarnation is the next step in this tremendous role that we all have to follow. Reincarnation is another day in school. It is another opportunity to grow, and all we have accomplished to date in this life are brought forward from previous existences. All these virtues and strengths become part of a new standard of education. The time must come, and is coming, when education must take on its final purpose, namely that education is necessary to fit the individual. To become part of a great motion of life to which he belongs, a motion which leads through time and space to final identify with the cosmic integrity. It has to do with the fulfillment of all things. It has to do with the achievement of a purpose for life. That is one of the problems we have. We have more doctors than we know what to do with. We have more attorneys than we need. 
We are now developing the largest following of computer operators that will be necessary in the next 2000 years. By that time, there won't be any computers. All of these rather foolish things show how we will take time and energy, and go through universities or take crash courses all to get $2 an hour more on the paycheck, or to get a job or something of this nature. We will do much for physical security, but nothing for the integrities upon which life and physical security must ultimately depend. We must begin to realize that we have to grow, and growth is an acceptance of realities. We grow when we can take an event in our own lives, dissect it and find what it means. We can do a certain amount of growing if we take a certain mistake which we have nursed for a long time, gradually learn to know why it is a mistake and decide not to repeat it. We can use our own lives as handy textbooks and reference works about things we need to know. We have to do this type of thing, or else continue to drift along and reap uncertainties which most people suffer from. At some time these uncertainties catch up to them and make them pretty miserable. The rich man who died takes nothing with him but what he has learned. If he has devoted enough time to material investments and banking he is not going to be much good in a different world where these do not exist, or even this world if he comes back when they are no longer practiced. We have to build enough of the now to protect ourselves in daily living, but we must also build in enough of tomorrow to serve us when tomorrow comes. We must do what is necessary to make this life useful, necessary and helpful, but we must also be laying the foundations for future lives in which better values will become the basis of better living. In India and other parts of the Orient, the law of karma is simply accepted so completely that no one really doubts it. It is not something you have to argue about or convert someone to. To the Oriental mind it is the only reasonable answer. What else is reasonable for the individual to work with? There is a possibility that he doesn't survive, and that there is nothing. That when he passes on good and bad cease together, because he has ceased. In a universe which has gone through as much as this one has in the last million or two years, it seems rather foolish to announce that everything is ending in nothing, that all this great struggle should mean that each individual should pass on, never know again what happened, and never again be himself. He simply ceases to exist. The materialists have tried to make this look attractive, by suggesting that we leave behind us our memories, our achievements and some kind of a memorial to our accomplishments. But if we do not even live to know that this has happened, there is very little real satisfaction in ceasing to exist even if we are represented by a stone here on this planet. The next thing is, what about the future? Do we go to some abstract place, better or worse, where we must face the consequences of our actions? Where if we are wrong we are punished, if we are virtuous we are punished also, unless we belong to the right group that gives us a certain survival? If we get there what is there? There is nothing but a vast ghost land of suffering and misery. Individuals punished for things that they did not know enough to avoid millions who had not been very bad or very good, suffering together in some cruel limbo under the domination of an infernal power which should have never had a place in a God-given universe. If this is forever and ever, and that the individual who is going to suffer this respect, I think it is high time for most people to come to a rather simple solution. If this is true we are not going to believe it anyway. We are going to refuse to accept eternal damnation for the transitory mistakes of modern human ignorance. We might need a chastising or a slap on the wrist or something, but this idea of eternal damnation is certainly no longer acceptable to a conscious or intelligent human mind. We also have other possibilities, such as by joining the right church or something, so that we have a better opportunity over there by way of consideration. The fact remains however that the whole thing is a frustration. The whole thing ends with the simple fact that the average individual leaves this world not bad enough to go to hell and not good enough to go to heaven. Under such circumstances the answer is inevitable. The only thing to do is to come back here and finish it. We need to have this encouragement. We need to have the idea of what is going to happen. In order to know what is going to happen the law of karma and reincarnation have been linked together because reincarnation is the solution to the imperfection of human life. Karma is the pressure behind the individual to help him to outgrow his mistakes and the pressure of the discomforts of wrongdoing. These are the pressures that karma works with. There is nothing ugly, unpleasant, terrible or tragic about the operations of karma. Karma is by nature kindness, because it is forever providing new opportunities for the completion of unfinished business. It helps us to be sure that in the due course of things we shall also develop the consciousness that is necessary to us. We may also ask, if this be the case, what about what happens? What are the laws of karma bringing about in the larger pattern of things? What is it that lies beyond for which we are trying to perfect ourselves? 
In the first place, the perfection of self is really simply a natural necessity that we should unfold our potential as part of potential itself. The reason why this planet grows is because the seed is planted, and each life is a part of the growth of something. When we plant a seed of a tree, why do we plant it? It is because we hope it will grow into a tree, and we hope that that tree will have a reason for existence, because we know also that in that tree will be also the perpetuation of itself. The fact that these growths are all continuous seems to indicate a universe of unfolding integrities and values. Somewhere in the large mystery of things the separated being, that part of the divine nature which was isolated in creation and is scattered now through every form of living thing, from man to the smallest cell or atom, will be gathered up. All this, as Pythagoras points out, will be gathered up in this great moment, when all these sparks become one again. On that occasion the divine being, who is made up of these sparks, will become alive again. We resurrect or save the divided energies of God, returning them to their source, and the divine power is fulfilled, completed and made perfect by the constant contribution of its parts. When all things gather together God blazes forth in the certainty of itself. It blazes forth as the perfection of all things. The sparks return to the flame, and all that is not part of the sparks, and not part of the worldliness, is absorbed again into the essences from which these things came, so that in the end we are really all a great eternal divine power growing up in the multitude of imperfect sparks, gradually becoming liberated from the limitations of matter, and finally returning again to the infinite splendor which is our true nature and substance. What we are going to feel, how we are going to think or what we are going to do when we are again part of the infinite is rather beyond us at the present time, but we know that it is in the keeping of an eternal power, and that the end of all things is perfection. Nothing is lost. There is nothing that can exist that isn't part of this growing thing that must ultimately become perfect in its own right. Consequently, we are all working, in a sense, maybe, to rescue the separated parts of the eternal and bring them together, returning the infinite diversity to once more, to complete an eternal unity, that we are working all the time for the salvation of the one life that exists in this world. For the universe itself is suspended from one life, and this one life is clothed in the universe, and the perfection of this one life, through the perfection of its parts, is the absolute, and abstract resurrection. It is the final release of eternal life from the limitations of form. But this life, being thus released, brings with it something that it could never have had had it not divided into its parts, and had these parts gradually grown up and became part of itself. When they become part of itself these parts in their own right will know what makes eternity itself, what creates the final and ultimate. When it's returned to the infinite it shares the wisdom, the love, the hope, and the eternity of the great power from which it came. In other words, the return to God is a perfection through effort. A return of the part of the spark to the flame. It is not a dead loss, a dead silence, a dead deepness somewhere. In some mysterious way, when we reach that ultimate union we will discover that we are in the presence of a creating divine power which functions on one principle alone, and that is love. All hates, fears, doubts, beliefs, must finally be absorbed in love, for love is that which fashions all things. The lack of that love has given us our present disasters. We must finally find our way back again to union with that power which is infinite love, and in so doing share in that love. Then war, sorrow and strife will be no longer in us, and we will be part of that eternity for which we were created and to which we must continually aspire. Thank you very much.